vulnerable. <laughs> Already. You're the third time, not me. This is the inaugural first ever Frequencies, a human design podcast with my guest, Sean Walbridge. My name is Jonah Dempsey, and I'm excited to be talking with Sean today uh, about a lot of things, human design and otherwise. Thanks for joining, Sean. Yeah, cool, man. I mean, we met yesterday, so <laughs> it's pretty cool that uh, we're already we here. But... Four email exchanges back and forth, which you're my kind of person. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. People who know me know mm -hmm. that I, uh, I love a good email correspondence. Cool. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm 51. I live in uh, on Vancouver Island at West. Um, grew up in Toronto. Um, I uh, I definitely experienced uh, a Chiron return, and I'm kind of smack in the middle of it, and it's what kind of opened me up to human design and all sorts of other things, all over the same weekend, to be honest. Plant medicine, human design, uh, meditation, like one weekend that blew my mind two years yeah. ago. That was two years ago. I was, was going to ask. Yeah, that's. It would be interesting yeah. to see the chart for that actual um, time. You know, that that's actually something interesting to look at. Is like what was going on in the transits for you, and what was, yeah, for sure. And I and I think like I've I've gone back and looked at the dates a few times, but it was like within three weeks of the physical date, right? Like where that moment happened, and weeks before was a really pronounced one of several ego deaths I had that kind of led me there. Um, I had a Chiron return reading with uh, Lavina Archers way, way back when I didn't really know what I was reading, but I took some hints from it that really shaped my exploration and accelerated it. Um, and I think the, the, the thing that I took away from that was one is that your body prepares around 46, 47 for this. And right around that age, I went and had uh, surgery and had 70% um, of my stomach removed because I used to be like 310 pounds. So really? I literally had transformation that actually you know on the surface everyone's going hey you look great or people didn't even recognize me but my world was crumbling around it um my best friend was a large dude turned out to be not such a great friend that led down a whole series of struggles but as i was losing weight he lost his fat buddy and that shows it like you know you'd think that just losing weight would be this great thing but it had a whole bunch of stuff that mm -hmm. you know started breaking down and led to reaching out to some shaman is kind of like, if I don't fix this, I'm in trouble. So um, yeah, so, and all that lines up direct, like perfectly with the whole Chiron return and a couple of clues that little Vina planted that I don't know necessarily she intended or I picked up on, but just, you know, um, I don't know if you want to go deep into Chiron return off the bat, but like basically. Sure, no, I, I do. I mean, the Chiron is the flowering and it's like life just said, Hey, you're ready to flower. So yeah, yeah or die right if you don't address it you're done right so you know my understanding of Chiron return is basically a lot of people are having it but it just becomes that midlife crisis dudes buy trucks women get boob jobs or you know whatever's going on that they need like to fill a hole in their cup yeah there can um, often be a midlife or, crisis with the uranus opposition and then the chiron return can be when a lot of health problems kick in if someone hasn't really done the work um, of, you know, alignment to their true self and purpose in their 40s. But it sounds like you were kind of preparing for it and you were already going through these big transitions even before the, the Chiron exact. Yeah, I would say I was an unwilling participant. Like I didn't know I was participating at first, but uh, it became painfully evident later. And like one of the visuals she used is she, she showed this sort of Greek god, like the Chiron with the half man, half horse, pulling a, a, an arrow out of his hip. And uh, I took that quite literally. Maybe that's the three, five me or whatever. But I was like, I've always had hip problems. And in fact, went to see a chiropractor 20 years ago. I'm just explaining my thought process of how I got where I got. But um, I went to see a chiropractor and he took an x-ray and it turned out my right hip was fused to my spine. Like I couldn't sit cross-legged as a kid. I was always that difficult kid in class in the 80s, which back then teachers were not kind to kids that didn't do what they were told. Mm -hmm. um, and so I... Once I saw that imagery, I was like, oh man, that explains a lot, right? Like I would like to heal that wound. So I started going down, uh, you know, I learned about uh, the Mars uh, design uh, line and how that identifies your genetic trauma and mine was shame. And then I was like, started reading the shame. I was like, holy shit, that is exactly what I feel. And 
And then I went to see a yoga instructor and between that and CBD, I was like, I basically spent the last year and a half trying to crack open my hips. Like, in fact, if you were to ask my train at the gym, I just always talked about how I want to be able to do the Van Dam. That was my goal is that like by 51, I want to be able to like do the splits on a pair of chairs. Right. So in my mind, I think it's funny, but really I was trying to like uh, rock this Chiron thing. And what I didn't actually realize is it, until fairly recently is that it actually sort of opened up new gifts, like new channels, new gates, right? And as you've seen in my my body graph, like Chiron gives me all, like one gate shy of a full penta, which, you know, and, and the 515, which is this, the gate of rhythm, I guess, or channel of rhythm. Um, uh, I guess I'm rambling, but. No, no, no. And I'm actually, this is a good opportunity to share your chart. And I'm very interested in Chiron. Um, I have a, in astrology, which, you know, I, I started as an astrologer. I have a grand trine with my Chiron at two degrees Gemini, my personality sun, or sun as they call it in astrology, at two degrees Libra, and then my midheaven um, in Aquarius. But yeah, here's your chart. And um, Right. And so you, so you were saying that, um, yeah, I mean, very packed Penta channels. And then you were yeah. saying, so of course this won't show the Chiron, but I know that some people look at what gate the Chiron's in. I, I can't actually tell you what gate my Chiron is in. That's something I should look at. Uh, it's two degrees Gemini on the personality side. So I wish that I had that kind of ability to translate the degrees to the gates. I'm not, not quite there. Yeah, I'm not either. I just take screenshots and, and refer to it. But yeah, so I added the 515 and a couple others. And what's really interesting is I I had a reading with Richard Beaumont um, about five months ago. And and that was really interesting because it was like four and a half hours. He's sitting there sipping his wine and having a cigarette and telling stories. And like, it was really fun. But the whole time he's like, I don't understand why you're a drummer. Like, I, I don't see the, the channel of rhythm in you. And, and the whole time he's saying this. And then eventually he floats around to the Chiron and he's like, ah, there it is. Like, like we were like kind of, he's like, are you sure you're good at drums? Like he was asking all these really direct questions. I'm like, I used to think so until you said that. <laughs> and then, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's really also you, you, you do have 2946, which it's not called the channel of rhythm, but it is parallel to it. And it's, it's its own way of getting in the flow. You could say, I mean, it has its own vortex. I, I play drums and I play um, piano and other instruments and, I don't have the 515 and then I know people who do have it who can't keep time. And so, you know, I, I don't know that everyone that has the 515 can keep time. They march to the beat no. of the drum. They might be out of sync with the rest of the band because they are doing it in their timing, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, but like even that, just the clues that came from that really kind of, and, and what's interesting is like, I, it was really in the drums as a kid and then went many years where I was a drummer, but didn't love it. Never practiced. No, was interested. And then sure enough, about a year and a half ago, prior to this knowledge, I was like, it was coming back like to the point where I was like, I'm done with my career. I want to move back to music. Yeah. That was happening in the background. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Some of these things kind of correlate coincidentally. Some are like, no, that I want to dig deeper into that. And so, yeah, it's been pretty interesting. So um, Chiron was, led to all sorts of things It led to me digging into deep into metaphysical anatomy and um, using cannabis for somatic trauma relief and like, like literally healing my body. And I've, I know this might sound strange to a lot of people, but I've been targeting ailments on my body um, and all sorts of things and actually have sort of self healed in many ways. I've kind of proven to myself that I can because there's such a metaphysical link between the head and the body. So I, you know, I discovered after, really a couple significant plant medicine experiences with LSD and um, uh, psilocybin and stuff. Um, but cannabis, I, I, I've made the discovery for myself that I'm really grateful that I did not discover or did not take, have pot when I was a teenager because I would have abused it like I did alcohol. Um, I grew up in the 80s, the war on drugs. I used to think if you had a joint, your head would literally burst into flames, right? Like it was that kind of fear around everyone in Toronto or anyone I knew. So I was the squarest drummer that anyone would have known. Um, but what I ended up discovering was cannabis like two years ago as edibles. And to me, it's been a real, it's been the most valuable tool, actually. Like I can do such deep personal work with just like five milligrams of a gummy where I just sit, sit and get quiet. And I think for me, the difference has been 
my belief is when you smoke it, you're sending the signals up to your brain and you're shutting off your head from your body. And your body is that meat sack is the memory bank that we just retrieve the stuff from our head. When you're having an edible, I actually quiet the whole body down, kind of get quiet and, you know, um, calm. And then I will sit there with my metaphysical book and be like, oh, okay, my, my right uh, elbow's twitching or whatever. And I'll look up right elbow and my book will be like, oh, you're is you have a situation with a male figure in your life that and all of a sudden I'll be transported back to a time when I was younger and that dis-ease will kind of surface. I'll I'll kind of see myself at five, but as an adult, I'll kind of tell that kid that, you know, we got this. And then usually I basically like kind of like a little slump in my chair, almost like I've slept for five years. Like it's a 10 second nap, but it's feels like heavy. And then usually I have to purge like bathroom or something um, and literally it leaves my body. And the next day I just feel a little bit lighter. And I've been doing that hundreds of times over the last two years that I've quite literally shed a lot of old stuff and my whole mind and body and relationship every day is so much different than it used to be. So now which, which book is this? Which, which metaphysical book do you look in? It's by Yvette Rose. Yeah, right here, actually. Um, the first version of it was terrible because the index was off by one page through the whole book. Oh, no. Um, this guy here. Physical anatomy. But, Interesting. Yeah. yeah so it's uh, Your Body is Talking. Are You Listening? So she's got a couple books. She's got one for children, too, like Dealing with Kids Trauma. And um, it, it's amazing because it's... And, <laughs> It's it's incredible. It's a, a, a resource that I think everybody could benefit from. Um, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's powerful. I, I'm cross of healing and I have an undefined spleen. So I am always on the lookout for things like this. I know uh, Louise Hay, for instance, does this kind of interpretation where, um, where it relates, but uh, I really, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to try that now. Um, I've done a couple of similar things. Uh, the first thing I thought of while you were kind of talking about that was as a teenager, I did experiment with pot, but I don't think I abused it because I had a pretty healthy attitude about it as a helper and so on. And, um, but I do think, I do agree with you that it's so different when it's taken as an edible versus smoked. And there can be, there's so many different nuances as well, what strains and this and that. And I don't, uh, I don't smoke anymore, but I, I am curious about the edibles now that you've mentioned that I haven't taken an edible for some time, but as a teenager, I loved Robert Anton Wilson. Have you heard of him at all? He's a kind of a counterculture guy. He, he isn't around anymore, but um, he wrote the Cosmic Trigger series. You you would like him. I just know from our email correspondence, he's a real joker, trickster, keeps people on their toes, and uh, you know, and really just a witty, clever, great writer. And in his Cosmic Trigger series, he talked about how he had a radical transformation through the use of cannabis combined with the work of Wilhelm Reich. And Wilhelm Reich was a medical scientist who kind of became, uh, he was actually locked up by the AMA for practicing medicine without a license or something like that. And But it was kind of trumped up. Uh, he had some pretty far out ideas like orgone. Orgone was kind of an etheric energy that he was making orgone accumulators. This was all back in the 1940s and 50s. So very controversial at the time. But one of his concepts is the concept of emotional armoring, which says that we hold emotional trauma in our muscles and in certain kind of painful, tender muscles, but also fused uh, fascia and so on, and specifically in the chest, all over the body, but much of it in the chest when it comes to, to the emotional level. And so he was a practitioner of deep tissue massage of these fascia muscles combined with marijuana and people would have memories of early childhood or of different times in their life that would kind of be released in tandem with, with the, the physical release. So that's the first thing I thought of while you were talking about that. Um, the second is I've actually been attending um, or going to um, sessions. I've done a, a number of sessions with a man in Santa Fe who I just want to give a shout out to uh, for anyone who watches this and either is visiting Santa Fe and wants to see him in person, um, like for the High Desert Human Design Conference, which I hope you'll come this year. I, I'll make sure to get all the info to you. 
It's in yep. September this year, September 13th to 17th. Um, or he also does remote work. Um, but his name is Raphael Weisman, and he's in his 70s, and he's been a channel for many years. He does a lot of channeling work, and recently he began doing emotion code work. And the emotion code work, he essentially takes his own metaphysical book, not metaphysical anatomy, but he takes a book that kind of has um, emotions more than the physical. It's more about the emotions. And he'll use a, a pendulum or a kind of a, you know, he'll he'll basically douse and figure out where what the emotions are. And he's been able to pinpoint, you know, he can tell if it's genetic trauma or if it's inherent or or how it's work you know these varieties and he'll be able to tell me obviously with genetic trauma you can't really confirm it because he can say how many generations back it might be it's not like i can go back there's no real history records of oh your great grandfather on your dad's side had a lot of fear or had a lot of anger or this or that emotion but then for the personal ones that have been accumulated in this life he's been able to pinpoint to the year and I'll actually know exactly what he's talking about when that humiliation occurred, when that anger occurred, when that grief occurred. And he's able to pinpoint it and then uh, do a sort of releasing, which often results in yawning and this feeling of kind of tiredness like you're talking about. But it's like a nervous system reset. And, I, the, and how I look at it is that the solar plexus in human design is also the nervous system. It's the, it's really is the nervous system. It's the, the CNS, it's the, the you know central nervous system. And so you really, when you go through these emotional things that you feel these sort of nervous system resets, kind of like what, what you're talking about. Um, so, and then the other thing I thought of is that it, I think on a more mainstream level, people are now, EMDR is getting more accepted. And I've done a number of EMDR sessions or I've, I used to do tapping and I used to do, it's still not totally accepted. Are you familiar with EMDR at all? It's just it's, a little bit. Yeah. I'm tapping, it's like, but... it's eye movement. So yeah, there is, there's tapping and then there's EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization, where essentially you kind of go into traumatic experiences while your eyes are following a, a moving light mm -hmm. and it can desensitize those triggers. Um, and that's kind of, I mean, it's interesting that, in this nine centered era, we have a number of parallel modalities that have emerged in different ways. And then you've kind of come up with your own modality. I mean, right. I mean, that is kind of your own intuitive way. I mean, you have 1057. So that is part of, uh, I'm going to pull up your chart again. Um, yeah. 1057 and uh, 46, which of course is, is that great healing gate and you know, activate it twice. And then, yeah. And then you have 1057 here and, and uh, the, the 10, Kevin is really interesting. If you're, uh, and especially with that book, if you want to hear a, an anecdote or what please, I just said. Please, I would love to. T yeah, tell me. So, um, where do I start? <laughs> uh, I'd already done a lot of this somatic trauma work, like like dozens, if not hundreds of sessions. Like literally would go to bed at seven o'clock and tell my wife, hey, babe, I'm just going to go hang out. I'd have my little gummy. I crack open the book and I do my work. And, you know, I'd have that little slump and go to sleep and stuff. So that was really profound. I got used to using this book. Like it's a reference. I don't, you don't read it. You just go like, oh, knee pain, go to page 396. And by the way, I've been experimenting with this with a number of people now that I, if someone says to me, oh, I've got uh, lower back pain, they'll tell me where it is. I will take a picture of the book and send it to them via text. And every single time I get back, holy shit. Like that's always what they say. Like they read it and they're like, I immediately thought of my mother at this event. Like it's that kind of like, like that kind of memory bank mm -hmm. so i learned to trust this book for this kind of the 1057 um this i kind of discovered this even before talking to richard Bowman, but he said a couple of things in that call that really was like i started to connect the dots but um i get a i was getting a ringing in my right ear when i was on a heavy dose of psilocybin so as a drummer i i was convinced that i had hearing problems like i used to say i would read lips and stuff like that because um, I would, I thought I wasn't hearing what people were saying. And uh, I believe that because 40 years of playing drums, that sounds right. Um, but then when I, when I had a high dose of magic mushrooms one night doing a solo at home, I could hear my wife and son talking at the other end of the house, a floor down, 
three rooms apart with three doors closed as though they were 10 feet away from me. And so I was like, how can I hear that? Right. So I became like, okay, that's really interesting. Why do I hear that? So then I cracked open the book and it was like I read on ears and hearing loss. And the first thing, it, one of the things it said was um, the right ear listens for danger and the spleen, as I understand the defined spleen is about being you know, aware. Like I can dodge out of, like, you know, I can hear something coming and get out of the way quickly. And I've, I've had a lifetime where I've sort of done that. Like my, my wife even talks about she doesn't like to walk behind me going into an intersection because I'll just go because I know I'm safe, but they're not safe, right? Following me blindly, right? It's not a good yeah. scene for them. And this has been like a repeatable pattern. So so my, my ear was ringing. So that was interesting. So then I read the book and it says, you're listening for danger. So then I started Googling and I found a woman in town who does ear candling. So I went to do that. But before I went, her website said, just a heads up or something like this. Um, a lot of people comment that after they've done these sessions, they've got more like psychic like abilities. And to me, I was like, ah, cool, more, more tools, right? So I went and had my ears candled and sure enough, my intuition of just like sensing inflections in people's tone when they're talking went up like 300%. Like I could hear a waver in someone's voice where I knew they were upset or not telling the truth. And it would lead to me asking some questions and then I'd find out truths, right? That I didn't have before. So that was really interesting. So my ears were clear, right? Mm -hmm. So I got candled. All of a sudden I could hear better. My intuition went up a notch. But then... Um, I think Richard Bowman said something or something connected, but I was like, I hate taking phone calls because I hold the phone to my left ear. And every, in my mind, I always said like, I hate phone calls because they're always a disaster. But I think it's because I can't hear the intuition, you know, the intonation in their voice. So I can't get the, the instincts I need. So I then started switching to, I only take phone calls wearing my AirPods where I can hear both ears. I love phone calls now. Like it, and it was kind of like, Oh, I actually know what's going on. I can hear what's going on. It was so powerful for me with that, right? So that was really interesting, like how I could actually read my body graph, do a little bit of digging, take a little bit of action, and then all of a sudden I have like a, a superpower that's that's proven to be very, very useful. Um, so that's pretty cool. And I'm, I'm grateful for that little gift because that gave, that set me on a path of like trying to experiment in other places as well. So... I love you added it. Well, it's very compatible with what we learn in human design as well. Um, it's interesting that the metaphysical, you know, anatomy book that you have mentions the right ear lessons for danger. Absolutely. I mean, uh, this is part of uh gate 10 is listening for danger, and then gate 22 um is really where it, it does listen to the emotion behind the the words. And of course, you don't have gate 22 activated. I'll show your chart again. I don't have it either. Um, but just because we don't have it doesn't mean that, you know, we don't still listen with our left ear for emotions. It's kind of just like you were saying, you know, I don't have gate 57. It might be dangerous for me to follow you in traffic because I don't necessarily have um, the the quick reflex of somebody, that somebody who has gate 57 and a defined spleen has. Um, but it is interesting that, yeah, the, the 57 and the 22 are kind of the right and the left ear, respectively. And uh, the 57 can really listen in the moment and respond in the moment. Whereas the 22, it kind of gets past the security guard, right? It, it, and it bounces around. And so Ra, for this reason, would only give readings in person, if anyway, if he was in person with somebody, he would only give readings sitting to their left. So he would talk into their left ear because he didn't want them to be able to respond in the moment and say, now, you know, how about this? And I don't know about that. And, you know, because the right ear is so ready to uh, just jump at anything it hears. And the left ear is kind of like, it, it's, it's caught off guard a little bit, you know, it can kind of pass, pass through. Well, let's take a short break um, and I will recreate our Zoom meeting, but this has all been <laughs> absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for this. We'll just take a very short break and I will send you another invite. And we have a few other topics to talk about, uh, but I'm loving this. I'm already getting so much out of it. And when we come back, I want to share my hearing story because I have my own. This is just perfect for a cross of healing like me. I just have to say for a cross of healing, I eat this stuff up. I mean, this is this is very much very relevant to my personal life as well as um, being interesting uh, for human design. Well, awesome. And it's kind of validating for me too, to, to know that when I'm saying it, 
you're echoing back like, yeah, it checks out because I don't have a lot of people that say this. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll take a short break and then I will uh, tell you my my hearing loss story. So. Okay, so we're back. So I was just gonna share a little story about my own experience with hearing loss. And uh, this is something where I just figured, you know, I love electronic music. I've probably been to quite a few raves. I'm 39 years old now. This was maybe three years ago or so. So I was kind of, oh, I guess all of the uh, loud music finally caught up with me. And I talked to a couple, um, people about it and they just said yeah that's kind of the way it is you know and they didn't really think I could do much and I, I don't think I tried an ear candle I think I was going to but I had like bought one but I never got around to it I needed, you know needed someone else to try it or something like that but then one day I was just first lining just deep diving on like is there anything I can do because I could actually just hear you know one ear was not great the other ear um was really bad. Like it was just really quiet. Like if I plugged one ear, it just felt kind of like the other ear was plugged. And actually there were a couple of interesting related symptoms. I was having a TMJ and I, I was mouth breathing and so on. So around that time I started mouth taping at night. Is that, is that something you've ever heard of or tried? Yeah, I tried it for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And I still um, like even more recently, I've been doing the Buteco breathing or just trying to slow my, my breathing and do more nose breathing and you know, I, I don't have a great track record for that. But anyway, um, some of this was, it, it was working a little bit. And I even went to a um, a guy who did saline injections of trigger points. And he did injections in the pterygoids, which are these muscles in the jaw that are really difficult to massage. Like you can't really get to them very easily. Because I do a lot of trigger point therapy and that was helping as well. Like I would I would do like trigger point therapy of my jaw and I would get, you know, kind of a pop of the pressure releasing in my ears and I could suddenly hear better. But finally, I just found there was a guy online and he talked about doing, using a water pick on the lowest setting with room temperature hydrogen peroxide. And at first I thought this is not going to work, but he said, you need to use like two bottles of this hydrogen peroxide. Like you need to just leave it for like five minutes, the longest five minutes of your life. <laughs> and I used this water pick and it wasn't like a ton of stuff came out, but some earwax did, but it, it obviously did something because I guess I just had impacted earwax or something. Sorry if that's gross, but I mean, I'm across the healing. I'm like, if this, if this helps anybody, I have no shame. You know what I mean? And after that, my hearing just became like, it was like loud. It was like, I started to like talk quieter. I started to turn things down. And uh, I haven't done it since then. That was a number of years ago. I haven't really needed to since then. But it was incredible to me how I had talked to doctors and they had said there's nothing wrong and it's just the way it is. And, you know, it's kind of, but no, I mean, something like an ear candle or if you have a water pick, it took like two good side, you know, two good jugs of hydrogen peroxide. I will say uh, I, I understood why it needs to be room temperature. Even body temperature is actually better because it does make you a little dizzy if it's too cold. And the first time I was like, whatever, I don't need to make this warmer. I'll just do it. And then I was like, oh, I feel really dizzy and weird, but it changed my life. I mean, my quality of life for multiple years had been declining and I was getting TMJ. I was getting tinnitus. I was getting like, I was having to look at people while they talked to me because I couldn't hear them very well. I was, I was miserable. And, you know, so um, I've, I've told a few people that, that trick and it really helped. So anyway, I just wanted to share that since it sounds kind of similar. I didn't necessarily notice, um, any new psychic abilities after that, but it, you know, it very well may have, but also I don't have gate 57. So that's part of it is I have a different relationship to hearing, I suppose. Yeah. I think I'm kind of lucky there, at least the good parts of that. Um, I, I guess the one thing I would say is that candling came after and I think it helped because I think it got rid of some of the the things that my body was storing to protect my ear. But really, it was the book and going through it like three or four sittings of reading the types of trauma related to that. And that was the whole 
I think that actually it was going through that, right? The the shadow work, the parts work of that. And then the candling was just kind of cleaned it up. So if you're missing the first part of just actually delving into that metaphysical, that mental relationship with the trauma and backdating those events and and going through them and then having that slump, like, and I, I'm not, I, I kid you not, like I would just slump. It'd be like, oh. and I, I felt like I slept for a thousand years and I was like, oh, back up, right? And uh, well, I think that's a awesome. bigger part of it. Absolutely. And it's kind of similar to when, um, you know, the guy I was mentioning, uh, Raphael Wiseman does his emotion code work. There is this sort of reset where I would feel really tired and then yawn. And he would sometimes, I mean, he yawns too, as he does the work. It's interesting. It's like we kind of calibrate. He's, he's, um, I'm undefined solar plexus and he has a defined solar plexus. And so I, I wonder if there is a sort of calibration that happens um, in that regard, but yeah, I am. I am definitely going to pick up a copy of Metaphysical. Um, you know, this this book you're you're, you're mentioning. You yeah, said it's if uh, Metaphysical Anatomy. Is, yep. is the... Yeah, and she's got a YouTube channel now, and she actually she's a quite regular lately. And like the stuff she says is just incredible. Like, I, she, there's gonna be a lot of people that poo poo it because it's not the traditional foundational stuff. But like, I don't know. It's been huge. And as I say, I, every time I someone has an ailment like to slide them a screen sh- or a picture by a text and every time there's like big moments to the point where I have a friend um that I've sat by a zoom call and um she'll be she'll have a little bit of cannabis because she's like super chilled and relaxed and I think this might be my 13 coming into of just listening and letting her talk through stuff but she has passed out on these calls a few times after processing something she just said like she like I won't say her name but like hey come on back and then she'd just be like, huh. what happened? Yeah. And then she, the next day she's like, my back doesn't hurt anymore. Like it's been that kind of stuff. In fact, there's another fella. We went, we had a medicine retreat over a weekend and he was talking about shoulder, like serious shoulder pain, like his whole life. And I was like, and we were about to do a big heroic dose of mushrooms as a group. And I pulled him aside and I was like, dude, take a, read this about shoulders. He had this big moment in medicine came out and had this memory of like um, a, a someone in his family history shielding a baby and a sword going through his shoulder and stuff. And at the end of that session, he's, he, I guess he had a, a nose blockage his whole life. Like, I don't know what we call this deviated septum or something. And at the end mm-hmm. of that session, he could breathe through his nose again. And he told the story. He's actually got his own um, uh, podcast and he, and he tells that story in one of his first episodes but I don't think he's even correlated to the book. Like he just remembers all the stuff afterwards, but I'll take a little bit of credit where it's like, Hey dude, just read this. And I think I planted yeah. a seed that in the medicine came up to the surface, like a pimple. And then you lop it off at the head and out it goes. Right. And that was pretty profound. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Now I, I do want to just ask one question. Uh, so I'm very curious to try this. Maybe others may be curious as well. So you're saying uh, when you kind of go into, in this sort of, relaxed state possibly with the help of a gummy um and you're kind of going into this memory is there anything in particular you do i mean you see yourself at that age in that memory you kind of reassure yourself maybe give yourself a hug i mean is it kind of like just because I, I, i've done some neuro-linguistic programming or i went to a hypnotherapist and we would do some somewhat similar kind of going back into memories with the new with uh, new resources we didn't have at that time and really making those available to kind of reassure the inner child from that time or the kind of younger version of ourselves from that time. Is that, am I summarizing it or is there something more specific or? Well, we go, practice, we go or? quite down a rabbit trail there because I'm into quantum jumping, which is basically subconscious hypnosis. I'm actually going to Toronto in a week and a half to take a hypnotherapy course because I've got so much interest in this. I've been delving into NLP and my very first Human design practitioner uh, Kendra is also an NLP practitioner, which is very useful. So which I, is- I know Kendra, Kendra Current. Yeah. yeah. Oh, she's wonderful. She's wonderful. She attends. Um, she has been to our human design events here in Santa Fe. She's absolutely wonderful. Fantastic, and she's done two readings, and also helped me in a sacral session just make a business decision that I was stuck on for six months, and then she tricked me because we're just talking, and then she like with NLP was kind of keep getting me relaxed. And then she's like, do you want to sell your business? I was like, uh-uh. And, I was, and she's like, there it is. <laughs> and I was like, oh. <laughs> and I've been trying to sell it for like six months, right? Like thinking I needed to. I, I yeah. do want to sell it. But at that time, it wasn't the right time. And immediately it felt right. 
but she duped me, like tricked me with NLP and like just yeah. that question. It was so perfect. So uh -huh. uh, I even recorded the moment and actually as like a little three minute video. So you could kind of witness it happening because I thought that was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, so between quantum jumping, which I could talk about and hypnosis, like I'm that subconscious is really interesting. And, and how I got into that was my very, that first shamanic weekend that I had, it, it was MDMA on the Friday and like, like heavy dose six hours like just you just reveal everything right your subconscious comes out and during that uh weekend they record it and they encourage you to play it back and listen to it later and I couldn't for six months because it was just so cringy right it was the subconscious all that stuff and so I didn't I couldn't do it six months later I listened to it and as I'm listening to it uh, and by the way I in my mind it was 40 minutes it was six hours and I would pass out every once in a while during it. But um, everything that I was saying, I knew what I'd say next. Even though I couldn't remember it, as soon as I heard it, I was like, oh shit, I'm about to say this. <laughs> like, I was just like, oh, here it comes, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> so that Absolutely. like really opened me up to like, oh my God, I'm storing all this stuff that I can't access unless, you know, with a little bit of help initially. Now I can do it just with straight up meditation, yoga nidra, that kind of stuff. I can really um, get quiet and get inside in seconds now whereas it took like an hour before so i've kind of mastered starting to master that skill so yeah well this is really relevant for me i do want to hear about quantum jumping in a second one thing i wanted to mention though is you know um you, you mentioned yoga nidra is that where you breathe from one nostril and then to the other or is that am i thinking of something else yoga nidra is the best nap you'll ever have so i i really uh, yeah, yeah, dude. So, like, I, I, I forget, like, my yoga instructor explained what yoga means. But, like, yoga nidra is you're lying on your back, you got a blanket on you, and someone just, like, steps you through a guided experience. And I, the first time I really heard about it was uh, Andrew Huberman, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Or if you haven't. I'm not. I'm not. Okay. I, I really, uh, I'll write him down. This is a, this is He's a very cool. prominent uh, podcaster and always talking about various techniques to like neuro techniques and uh, he said he does it twice a day for 15 minutes and each 15 minute yoga nidra is about four hours of deep rest so by bot like you literally sink into your mattress and like 15 minutes will pass and, and it feels like four hours so I will do that twice during the day so that I'm refreshed all the time and I've kind of gotten some other people into it and we've just opened a wellness center here in Victoria and we've had some um, classes of that and everybody leaves it going like what was that you know, like where you're so quiet and like I did it last week. And when the woman was talking, she was five feet from me, but I swear she was 150 feet from me. Like I was just, it was just so, I was so gone into this nap. It's powerful, powerful stuff. I, I couldn't recommend yoga nidra more. And it has nothing to do with stretching your body or falling over or doing cow pose or whatever it's just a, a right right it's, it's okay yeah i think what i'm thinking of must have a similar word because i remember there's a sort of a breathing exercise you can do and i've been getting a little more into those um just at a personal level like i mentioned i was reading about buteko i think it's called this russian breathing technique of slowing your breathing and i think for me it's just i can be a very amped up type a person a lot and in the more recent time, I've just kind of, I, I think this would be really just right up my alley. Uh, I, so I just want to say thank you again for giving me giving yeah. me some threads to follow up on as well. And are there YouTubes that are kind of guided or like how would I get into doing yoga oh, yeah. nidra? If you search for guided yoga nidra, they're all over the place. They're, my favorite is uh, Ali Boothrid. And she does a lot of stuff in the Costa Rican jungle. Like she's actually in the jungle as she guides you through it. And they're anywhere from 15 minutes to 45 minutes. There's lots of them out there. Um, and so I like a bit of variety because you can almost like know what's coming. So you, you kind of want to change it up anyways, because you you want to listen. You are... Here's the other thing I learned about yoga nature recently. Um, if you fall asleep during it, it's okay, because that's what your body needed that time. But the idea is that you don't fully fall asleep if you can, but it's, you know, it's, it's okay. You're not a bad yoga nature. It's just your body needed at that time, let it rest. And so you'll see... Some yoga nidras are for deep rest. Some are for before you go to sleep. Some are an alert yoga nidra. But really, it's and really what it is is she just gets you to calm down, and then she just gets you to imagine the tip of your pinky finger, then this finger, and and she, they just walk you up and down your legs and arms, 
And by the time you're done, you're just like, oh, like gruel coming out of your mouth. Like it's just awesome. So um, well, that sounds fantastic. I, I need that. You know, I, I, I definitely, um, I have a defined route. And it's funny because I, th- I think a lot of defined route people uh, don't necessarily know how to relax. It's like we, we know. How, so you have an undefined route. So you can become very wise about relaxation techniques. And you can learn and maybe help even the defined root people in your life to know how to set the pace and so on. And uh, but with me, with my defined root, it kind of is just can be a little bit of, um, you know, ignoring the stress and just like taking the stress or be even being the stress, Mm -hmm. sort of clenching my fist and just being this kind of stressed out person where uh, I really I really value and cherish in the same way that an undefined spleen can sometimes help defined spleens who might feel great, but might not be aware of certain health aspects. The mm-hmm. undefined root can help defined root folks uh, like myself to really learn how to relax because I know how to speed up and I know how to slow down, but I'll, oftentimes I'll slow down to build up the stress that gives me the energy to then speed up. And it's not really like I know how to actually relax sometimes. So that's, mm-hmm. that's what it's. Do you, do you struggle at all with anxiety? Because I've, I've learned a couple of things around that with breathing too. That's, oh, my that's, word. That's... Absolutely. And that's part of the reason I've been doing the Buteco breathing is I'm realizing the theory in Buteco, I hope I'm saying it right, it's, is the theory is that most people are hyperventilating all the time because they're either mouth breathing, which is something I do a lot, um, or they're just so excited that they're kind of forcing, like if I, you've seen my videos. I mean, people say, uh, wow, play HD bingo. And, you know, one of them is Jonah takes a breath, right? It's so rare. It's kind of, uh, or, you know, or when I am breathing, then I'm huffing and puffing and mouth breathing. And I can't even listen to my old videos. There's so much huffing and puffing. I I can't wait till they have AI audio correction to remove all of the huffing because, you know, and uh, I've been diagnosed with asthma and, you know, I was a pretty heavy smoker for some time and I'm not really a smoker anymore, but that's not really the best combination. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I do struggle a lot with anxiety. And for me, what I've noticed is when I'm, when I get more anxious, I'm breathing in so much and I'm like breathing out for less than I breathe in. Like I have a very low tolerance for CO2. And part of the theory of Buteco is that you actually don't get a lot of oxygen in the bloodstream that way. You actually need CO2 because it helps with the oxygen transfer to the bloodstream mm-hmm. and you need to nose breathe because that increases nitric oxide because we have nitric oxide in the nose that doesn't come in with mouth breathing nitric oxide lowers blood pressure so i mean these things are all related but yeah i'm i'm i have my notepad tell me tell me some of your suggestions for anxiety please well, I, because i'm actually going to make a video this morning for a friend so i might do that and send it to you after as well just like walking you through a breathing exercise that i've kind of combined from three or four sources, one of which was my tattoo artist that filled this in a couple of months ago. He gave me one little tip and it was like, I added it. But the one thing I picked up a couple of weeks ago is, and you already said it, when you breathe, the breathing out is really important for getting out of the anxious state, right? But what's most important is breathe out through your nose. And that's because your caveman body is no believes, it it basically knows it's safe when you breathe out through your nose. Because if you're breathing out through your mouth, you're being chased by a jaguar. Right. So your body actually gets tricked into going, oh, I'm breathing out through my nose. I must be safe, at which point the anxiety drops. So the whole exercise that I've sort of cobbled together from a series of useful sources is like you breathe in. uh, It's two breaths. One breath is I sort of breathe up into my chest and I actually envision my chest going out this way, too. So I'm trying to like expand my chest like this. But then when I get to the top, now I breathe in through my nose um, or yeah, through my nose directly, but I'm sending the air up to my temples. So the first one's, and then I take another sip and usually I'll even close my eyes and cross my eyes a bit and just kind of direct the, the air here, then hold it for two seconds. So all that takes about six seconds up, hold for two and then breathe out for 10, but through your nose, because you're telling your body that you're safe when you do it. And if you do that three or four times, um, oh, so here's an exercise. So I'm a three five. I experiment everything, right? I found <laughs> this is how this is how deep I went on this one night. I found an old video recording of a woman that in the 80s 
was trying to figure out how to cram a bunch of music onto a tiny little chip for um, games for arcades, right? Because they had these tiny little chips. They couldn't load a CD in there. So she basically had to figure out, like, how do I put a whole song on 1K on a chip? And so she was talking about, and but she was also expo- exploring um, playing with people's heart rates because she wanted to create excitement. And so there's this one video clip where if you watch it, she demonstrates for 20 seconds. The first time I watched it, I was like, holy cow, am I ever anxious? Like she really could just play with my my heart and my mind in this on this old audio clip. And so I I watched it again and I put on a blood pressure cuff and I was like, geez, it went up like 15 points, right? Just in those 20 seconds. Like this is how much these video games mess with our minds, right? We're all being messed with all the time. Um, mm-hmm. But then, but right around that same time, I had um, kind of cobbled together this breathing technique so what I did is I watched it again, and but I told myself, A, I know that I'm safe because I'm watching this thing, but I also just breathed through it. My blood pressure went down 10 points during the audio. So I, it was basically like 25, 30 points, degrees, whatever, just by doing the breathing work while I listened to this anxious music. And I was like, oh, damn, that works. <laughs> so now I'll just be like, oh, I'm talking to someone and like, I can feel them fired up and I can literally feel it in my solar plexus. Like someone has a define. I'm like, oh, here we go. I can actually feel it these days. Um, I'll just mm-hmm. do my breathing thing two or three times. And I can do it without them telling. Like I can and just look at them. I just don't close my eyes. But I'm going through those steps. And I'm just all of a sudden I'm cool as a cucumber, real time in that place. And it's just cobbling together those things. So the tattoo artist told me about the second sip. Like this where you're you already feel like you're full. But now you're just sending it from here to here. And I visualize breathe in the air right up into my temples. And that's had a profound effect for me. And I was high anxiety, which I'm assuming for me was the completely open head and Ajna, right? Just nothing to grab onto. So my brain's just, in my mind, I'm just constantly reaching for answers and stuff. And it's just this mental soup. And ever since I've been doing that, I'm just way more calm now. Like it's, it's been had a huge profound effect for me. And that's just a well, that's off. that's very really valuable. I'm going to try that. I mean, I've been doing the Buteco technique, which Buteco is all about slowing down your breathing. And you, you only breathe in and out through your nose. You slow it to where you can't hear. You, you don't hear like a loud breathe, breathing in or out. And you kind of suppress sighs or any sharp breathing. And the idea there is that it, it engages the parasympathetic nervous system. But I know that and some of the Buteco materials I've, I've been reading, they also mention like a longer out breath will also engage the parasympathetic nervous system, mm. which is kind of what you're talking about. Like if it's six seconds in and hold and then 10 seconds out, you're really, um, yeah. And I've heard a lot about the, the vagus nerve, I believe it's called. I don't know much about that. Or vagus that, or vagus. Yeah, the SIP helps with that. That's what that's for. Is that okay. Yeah, this is all a pretty new area for me. I mean, I definitely... I go through phases where I get kind of on health kicks, but recently I've been really wanting uh, just to to get some of my breathing uh, under control because I notice, I mean, not control even isn't the right word, but just healthier, healthier breathing habits. Um, I'm also at 7,000 feet. So, I mean, a lot of people get winded here, but I've noticed um, just the need to really learn how to breathe. It's something Ross said about gate 12 people and gate 22s that they don't necessarily know how to breathe, which is funny. You'd think we would, but it's like, we're kind of leftovers of the mutation because gate 12 is where the dropping of the larynx occurred 90,000 years ago that that gave rise to language. And maybe because of that, people who have activation there are still kind of, they have a different relationship to breathing and and to communication. Mm-hmm. So I have, a few, I have a few other notes here. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation so far, by the way. I've just been loving it. So one is, what is Rockstar Antics? I'm just curious about you. Tell me more about what is Rockstar Antics? Uh, you know, what's interesting is it was created quickly at a time when I needed a company to put a product. Um, but when I look back, it was like I had planned it subconsciously. <laughs> so um uh, long story short, own a computer consulting company for 18 years, 15 years. COVID came along. I had a bunch of developers that were uh, sitting around and not busy, and I didn't want to lay them off. Looking back, I should have. But um, at the time, I didn't. <laughs> 
And um, I had a band and we wanted more gigs because bands um, aren't only as good as how many friends show up. So playing shows as a band um, and we we're all pretty introverted. We just we would bring people out. Great band. But then they wouldn't come again. So we needed a shtick. And uh, in, in Victoria and lots of places in the world, there's this idea of uh, music bingo. So I don't know if you've ever played it, but there's regular bingo under the B, number one, I, whatever. Um, music bingo is uh, under the B, Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi. Super fun in a bar because you play 20 seconds of a song, you get the clue, people win prizes. You said that, like, it's a fun game that's way easier than music trivia because you don't have to actually know anything. You just have to recognize the hook, right? So it's a very popular mm -hmm. game. And so... I built the this prototype app for my band at the start of COVID because what else are you going to do? And um, and it it worked. And so all of a sudden I was like selling it to other like to pubs and stuff. And I built it in a computer consulting company, a cloud consulting company. That didn't make sense. So I needed a place to move that product, the IP of it. So I needed a name. I chose Rockstar Antics because it was called Rockstar Bingo. That was the name of the app. But looking back. I'm the rock star and these are the antics I get up to, right? Like it's, yeah. this is one of my pet projects, right? And um, so I actually had to go through, this is what drives me crazy, but uh, definitely you can tell in my chart, I'm very anarchist and like, that's who I am. So it makes me crazy that I had to sell the product from myself to myself and pay taxes on it and witness my own signature like basically I had to witness buying it from myself to myself so the government could collect gst on a product that i made in one company and moved to another and i'm about to do that exercise again to move it to a different company so this is i like 2027 and collapsing all that crap bring it on for me <laughs> like it's just done with all that bullshit but um so that's rockstar antics but to me it's my little incubator now of i get these ideas i take them to the point of wanting to grow them, but that's where I have to get out of the way. I'm, I'm an express builder. I, I understand through BG5, that's kind of my type and it makes sense for me. I can, I can do everything. I'm that kind of almost complete penta where I can just like train, the, like, like a speeding train into something, but don't leave me to run it. And I'm pretty sure that's because that's my 36 in the chaos. If things are running smoothly, I'm not happy. So I will just start blowing up the very things I built. So that's mm -hmm. my history to date. <laughs> So I've, I've become yeah. pretty familiar with my pattern to the point where I recognize now that Rockstar Antics is where ideas are born. It's my incubator. And then I hand it to the adults if it's worth continuing. And that seems to be a natural flow, but I'm still, I'm only two years into this and deconditioning and, and cleaning up the shrapnel mess that I left before where I had no idea I was doing, was just grasping at every opportunity, right? So it's, it's a big hot mess right now. So that's Rockstar mm -hmm. Antics. So couple of products in there. We also, the, the show itself is live band music bingo. We call it Rockstar Nights. My goal and my little tagline everywhere is have drums, will travel. I want to meet people. And, you know, in the human design circle, I want to go around and flex my, my 13, <laughs> like just meet with people <laughs> and make an impact in their lives just by hanging out. And I'm starting to have all sorts of occurrences where I'm just there. And sometimes I don't have to say anything and I'm watching people have like, these groundbreaking moments where like I'm just in the room and I just asked a question and you could just see in their faces. Like I just somehow knew what to say. I also recognize I, over the years, I didn't know I had said power was wanted to add value and said the wrong things. And those were disastrous. So, so I'm getting much better at wielding that weapon. So, uh, sure. or that, that skill. So well, you have three three verbal gunslinger, or is it three or even four? Because isn't the uh, yeah isn't the ten twenty also considered a verbal gunslinger channel? So you have, I mean, you're like a you're like generator, you're you're manifesting generator, self projected projector edition. You know <laughs> the special edition of the of the MG that comes with all four of the self projected projector channels. Because you know to be a self projected projector, you have to have one of these four channels, one or more of these four huh. channels of the, the 10, 20, the 7, 31, 1, 8, or 13, 33. Well, um, have you ever considered making a human design app in your Rockstar Antics yes. uh, incubator? Yeah, and I've got a, there's a couple of things that I would do uh, if someone had money. I'm done funding it because I'm still cleaning up my own financial mess. But yeah, there's a couple of things that absolutely, I think, need to be out there. 
like one would be, I think, yeah, I'm not sure. Someone, I hope someone runs with these ideas because this is what I've been thinking. One is, I think we need a human design analyst search engine, like one where you you put in your birthday and stuff, and it actually suggests a good fit for you because people resonate, right? And so it'd be almost like a dating app for human design analysts, I think would be very useful. So you get a good reading that feels good the first time. The other thing that I think is missing from every single human design app is where people could um, crowdsource their information into the app. So um, I would comment, uh, I'd be on there and be like, oh, my 1057, here's an example I did uh, in my life, like that story about my right ear and stuff. But actually like uploading that as a video and then people could see that and upvote it or downvote it based on does it resonate, but also it would be like, this is coming from a manifesting generator three, five, and someone else's comment would be like, well, I've got this, but they're a projector with it, whatever. That'd actually be really useful where you could actually like have some insights. And then here's the other one. <laughs> I think it'd be really useful in a Zoom call that above your head, almost like a heads up display would be like, tell it, give me clues about what you might be thinking during the call based on emotions or fears that are being triggered, right? So I'll, like it would like little heads up, like we're talking about this and the AI would be like, oh, let's talk about that. And, you know, Sean's got a fear of death or whatever. And it'd be like, and just like real time, like a heads up display, almost like Google Glass. I think that'd be quite doable and quite useful in meetings where you could actually like steer the conversation to make sure that we all leave it yeah. happy. I think that'd be pretty interesting. So, I mean, at the very least, that could be um, a really cool art project. And uh, there is an organization in Santa Fe called Currents New Media, and they have the Currents New Media Festival every year, which is one of the world's largest new media festivals. New media is AR, VR, AI, robotics, drones. I mean, it's it's art made with all the newest technologies. And uh, people have tried to use AI, like there was one last year where it would detect things about your face and tell you things about yourself using AI. And I think uh, building that even just as an installation where two people could sit and the cameras look at both of them and they could have a conversation and it starts to have this bubble. I mean, that might, you know, I think it'd be a great plug-in for Zoom, but also that might just be a nice art piece. So Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. I think also a dating app. And I think what you do is instead of charging monthly, it would be like the, you sign a contract, a contract of sorts. It'd be like, um, we're going to match you up with someone that looks like a good fit, you know, what are, whatever electromagnetic, all that stuff, like something that would feel like a good fit. But you have to go on two dates with the person. like and and But it'd be 500 bucks. And if after two dates, you don't want to go with them, you give the money back. So it's like no risk because wouldn't you pay 500 bucks to meet the perfect person? But you have to actually look past oh, it's they're not the kind of, it's not a blonde or something, like those ideas of what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like that I mean, would be- That's a really interesting one. You know, there's a guy named Steve Rhodes. Are you familiar with Steve Rhodes at all? Have you looked into his work? He's done his own, he studied with Ra, and then he made his own system called Bond 2, which is in reference to the Bond and the Two, which are the kind of the names the voice gave for the yin and the yang crystals and that, that oh, okay. collided. And so it's b a a n t u dot com, and he calls himself the relationship wizard. He has a whole um, formula he's devised, which he goes into in his book, the God Code. We are robots, which is such a fun name. It's like it's not enough to say the God Code. It's we are robots. And uh, but I actually really like Steve Rhodes. I, I used to kind of joke around a little bit, and he's easy to joke around about because. He calls himself the relationship wizard and has this kind of, but he's also innocence. He's innocence motivation. And I love Steve Rhodes. I have gotten so much out of his work. I have to say he's him and, and, you know, Richard Rudd are probably the two main um, offshoots of human design who are no longer really doing human design. They're doing gene keys and, and Bantu, but they really do a lot. And what Steve Rhodes claims to have cracked in short is that, the nodes are what, he doesn't use the term not self, but in my words, I would say the nodes are what we try to be as the not self. We strive to be more like our nodes, but actually they're really just here to tell us what we like in others. And what he's cracked is, he says that, now, have you gone much into substructure? Have you looked at tone or color, any of those things? 
I don't really fully understand that yet. I've done the rave yeah. cartography and it dipped in it, but on my attention span, um, I have to do the course again. Because <laughs> when I would well, drink, I mean, there's, there's a time and a place for everything. I mean, there's there's a time some people and it's in where we start and how we move through the human design material is so unique to us too. So there's absolutely no need for anyone to go. I mean, as an example, um, you know, uh, I, I would say that you know, Alok Diaz, who's one of the greatest human design analysts in the world, he's been in human design 31 years, um, you know, he was a good friend of Ra for 18 years, he transcribed him, he doesn't go much into color and tone, he knows all that material, he studied all that material, he will go into it, I attended a, a class series he did earlier this year, he spent a couple of days on color, and everything he said was amazing, I mean, he was actually really mind-blowing, so it's not that he doesn't have that foundation, but he just spends a lot more time looking at the gates and the channels and the polarities. But in any case, usually the conventional way of looking at color and tone is that it relates to awareness and that color is, well, color it refers specifically to the exit frequency of the crystals of consciousness. Tone is the frequency inside the crystals. And so tone is basically your cognitive underpinnings, like how I like to imagine it, we know that there's a design crystal in every cell in the whole body. So we know there's hundreds of thousands of design crystals being created, or not created, but new cells being created, each with their design crystals, and then cells dying, and that design crystal goes back to the prime bundle. And it's this amazing um, movement of design crystals. And then we have what we call the design crystal, our prime design crystal, which kind of orchestrates the whole thing. Well, each one of those crystals has a sort of holographic representation, almost like the Princess Leia hologram from Star Wars, of your entire body. So if you imagine a ballet dancer while they're doing all the pirouettes, every cell in their body has a little holographic representation of their whole body. As we're talking, we're making facial expressions. Every cell has an almost representation of that expressivity of the human form in it. And that's what we call tone. But the exit frequency is color. And so when the color isn't correct, when it goes into what we call transference, the tone can't get out. And then you have somebody who's clumsy or somebody who doesn't express the natural intelligence of their body. And you can kind of tell, you can tell that the color, the exit frequency is off. You know, they're, they're communicating and they're going into transference. Well, you can kind of tell something's a little bit um, off in that. Well, in any case, this is a conventional understanding of it, and that's a really wonderful way to understand it, that the color, for instance, your dietary regimen on the design side has to do with color, and there's different color dietary regimens. Mine is calm, so I'm meant to eat in a calm environment. Have you gotten into any of that? Oh, you're also calm. Great, great. Well, we're the least calm people you'll ever meet, you know, because that's why we need calm is because we're just so, you know, uh, odd. And same with Ron, you know, he was, he was calm digestive regimen. Um, then, you know, you have the design external. I'm mountains, for instance. So mountains does well in high elevations and you have others and so on. On the personality side, you have your view and you have your uh, motivation. And basically when the color is not in transference, the tone can get out. And when the tone can get out, uh, you have the cognitive underpinnings of your awareness that is kind of, you're, you have full access to, to that. On the design side, um, the color locks into the correct color and stops transferring when you start doing strategy and authority. And basically it kind of becomes this locking mechanism where the frequency locks in and suddenly you have all of these cognitive superpowers you didn't know you had before. Like you unlock new psychic abilities, you unlock new, because tone and color are all about awareness. That was something really profound that, um, I heard in Alokanand Diaz's seminar where he said, the mechanics end at the line. Me mechanics are up to the line level. Beyond that, it's awareness. So it's really interesting because your quad left, for instance, and we, we talk a lot, especially in um, you know more contemporary human design, it's really, really become popular to talk about variable, um, right? These, these arrows. And you'll hear people who are, for instance, quad right projectors. And how do they reconcile that the quad right isn't here to focus, but the projector has a focused aura? Well, the focus of the projector's aura is at a mechanical level. It just 
zooms in on your G center and focuses and burrows a hole right in your, you know, your spirit. And that's the projector's focused mechanical aura. But the variables talk about where the awareness is. Is the awareness focused or not? Is the awareness peripheral? Uh-huh. Uh, you're, uh, I'm very similar to you in that I have three right vari- or three left variable placements, rather. I only have one right variable placement uh, for me. But, but in any case, uh, it's just, just to kind of, I know it's a little bit of a, segue but or a, a side tangent but just as far as your idea of meeting people and human design dating what steve rhodes has done he came up with this completely on his own he said basically to him tone is the mood setter that tone is what puts you in a good mood or not and, and what kinds of things are going to put you in a good mood color is your resilience and so people who have colors one and two they need a lot of familiarity. Like your dietary regimen is color four. You're more resilient. You're kind of middle resilience, middle high, like me. We can have some familiarity, but we can also handle a bit of change. Once you get to colors five and six, Steve Rhodes claims these are people who crave change. They get so bored. So it was really interesting last year at the High Desert Human Design Conference, we had color one and two people who were kind of like our AV guy, Brian, uh, is color one, no, color two, digestive regimen, and color one, uh, personality motivation. He was concerned that something would go wrong. So he had extra extra battery backups and extra gear to record. On the other, which is totally correct for him. Like, I'm glad he did because you want people like that around for when things do go wrong because they have the backups and, you know, fear is meant to kind of have that solid foundation. Meanwhile, we had five and six color people. They're not worried about something going wrong. They're worried about being bored. They're worried that they signed up to get stuck in some really boring, monotonous thing. You know, they want the variety. They want the excitement. And so I think Steve Rhodes is really onto something here where what he found is Basically, your your sun earth colors are how resilient you are. And then your node colors are how resilient the person you're attracted to most would be. Mm -hmm. So you have all sorts of combinations. You have people with color one and two who are very low resilience. They require a lot of familiarity. Then their nodes are like caves or uh, markets. And they're drawn to people who are really low resilience like them. But then you have people that are one or two low resilience and they're drawn to really high resilience, or you have really high resilience people drawn to really low resilience and so on, all these combinations. And the same at the tonal level where what puts you in a good mood, one and two relates to the spleen. So those people are put in a really good mood from just succeeding, making money, winning, competitive. Then you have tones three and four. They're put in a really good mood by kind of what we're doing, which is Ajna. So by nine centered communion by being able to communicate with each other and understand each other. He calls these the respect tones. We respect each other and we show uh, that respect. And then you have five and six and they're the hedonists and they're put in a good mood from good food and good sex and good experiences and good comfort and things that feel good and so on. The solar plexus people. And so it's really fascinating because he's basically, this is why he calls himself relationship wizard. And it also works at the line level, by the way. I won't go into it now just for fear of, of it being, you know, too, but there are videos that I've made on it and you can always look in his book. And basically, um, I mean, I love what Ross said about color and tone, and it definitely is very deep and very accurate and incredible. But Steve Rhodes adds this whole extra layer and this very interpersonal layer that can explain why do we get so annoyed by each other? Why does somebody put us in a bad mood? Somebody puts us in a great mood. Why, right? I mean, ultimately we're still making our decisions with strategy and authority, but we can gain these new layers of awareness that can just help us understand and even just might even help accept that of like, I'm in a relationship with somebody, my nodes are expecting them to be like that. But they're not like that because their sun earth is in a totally different binary. So I have nodes that are in the feeling binary. You know, I have a tone six, which is saying I'm really drawn to people who are not type A like me. I'm a very type A left variable person. I'm really drawn to right variable, you know, because you're quad left. We know that 
you're also drawn to left variable people, basically. Um, we have to look at your tones to see what they are. But but basically, when you know the, the nodes are kind of drawn, it's like if that really is what we're drawn to. Now, this is not core human design from Ra, but I've been playing with this for about a year now, and I've seen it again and again where you have a couple where they're both left variable sun earths and they're both right variable nodes and or vice versa and you know their complaints about each other are basically that like my complaint about somebody would be you're not chill enough and they're like jonah you're not very chill you're you're totally type a and i'm like well i know i am but i expect other people to be more relaxed uh but you know it's been really nice because obviously when we are in relationships with people we there is a certain level of just accepting them for who they are steve rhodes said one of the most profound things about compatibility he says Compatibility is not love. Love is in the G center. Love is about the fractal lines. It's about where that person is on your fractal. Compatibility is about how much time you can spend with someone. <laughs> and that to me just blew it wide open. I'm like, I can love someone endlessly, but if my nodes need, because the nodes are kind of the signpost. And if I have a right variable node that's telling me that I'm drawn to a feeling person, I'm going to need to spend a certain amount of time around feeling people just to feel good. They chill me out. And when I'm around really other, other type A left variable people like myself, I'm going to get kind of stressed out sometimes, you know? So, so anyway, thank you for coming to my Ted talk on Steve Rhodes. I know that was quite a, quite a segue or quite a di divergence, but um, I just want to share that because, you know, this is something very interesting to me too. And I, I love your idea of this, $500, two dates, or your money back if you don't go on a third date or, or whatever, if you haven't found the love of your life. And I just think human design is so great for that. And it's not just about electromagnetics and compromises and those things. It, it's also very much about, I mean, hey, you can match people up. The classic one is when somebody's sun earth is the actual gates and lines of your nodes. I mean, that's pretty incredible there. Your nodes are pointing you and orienting you in your life path to their son earth. I mean, that's like, if that's not a finger of God, I don't know what is, you know, <laughs> kind of pointing you at them. So you could even uh, in that app suggest where they would go on a date based on one being caves and one being valleys or something. And like, you know, recommendations. Yeah. Like I, or I talk, ideally or the same environment. I mean, that's something else Ross said. He said in his dream world, the environments would all self-organize and coupling would happen based on environment and so on. And then, um, and then you would have, you know, they would all meet in other environments temporarily, but then go back to their ideal environment. So an interesting idea. Well, I know this has been quite a long talk. Should we should we save some of the next topics for maybe, can I have you back as a guest? Yeah, man. I'm I'm ready. You ready let, let, let's do that. I, let's, I, I'd love to just, let's wrap it up. Uh, I also know that you may be starting a podcast soon. I'm thinking about it. I'll run the, the idea by you and maybe someone will grab it, but that's okay. Yeah, please, please tell I, me. I, I think it'd be really interesting to have a pod because I, I, I want, I've, I've done like seven or eight readings, like had them. So it's getting expensive, right? So <laughs> I've even reached out to a few where it's like, can we do an energy exchange? Because I just can't afford to keep paying for readings, but I would love to get your filter a take on stuff, right? So I think it'd be fun to have a, a podcast where it's really my goal is to just learn more about me or other people but actually have a, a, an analyst on and say, here's a body graph. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I'm not even going to tell you if they're alive or dead. And just tell me about them. So say it was John Lennon. So they would be looking at John Lennon's body graph. And then, and, and you know, the whole idea is like, they don't know who the person is. So they're not, there's, all they do is talk about who this person might have been and, and like. And then at the end, just be like, okay, it's this guy what would he have been like if he was still alive and and something like that, right? Where you just kind of like almost like a game show, you know, like it's a game, right? Try to figure it out. And all the while, I think it would just generate all sorts of interesting discussion around it. Um, I love that. I love that idea. Well, I sign me up. Uh, I'd love to be a guest okay. when you get that. Thing, and that sounds really, really fun. I do look at a lot of celebrity charts. So, um, you know, you I'll have to, <laughs> yeah, well, I'll have to resist the temptation to hide the facts if I recognize it. And I'll have to tell you, okay, no, 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 I know who this is. And then you can give me another one. But, okay. um, 
but I, I, you know, there's a lot of celebrities out there too. And I, I don't, I don't have a, well, ever since genetic matrix changed, I don't know if they have it anymore. I used to just every day, I would just go down these rabbit holes of looking at celebrity charts because genetic matrix had the most wonderful database. They might still have it. It might just be on a different URL. I couldn't find it the other day when I looked, but they have this wonderful, yeah, they, have, they have a celebrity search and you could search by profile. You could yeah. search by profile and type. You could search. I mean, it was incredible. And uh, I used to spend so much time on that. But also, you know, I have undefined head and Ajna. I, I don't really remember things unless it's it's kind of funny what I do and don't remember, you know, it'll come up or not. So well, I would love to be a guest. Uh, we definitely have some other topics we didn't get to. So I'd love to have you back on. And uh, thank you so much, Sean. Are there any shout outs you want to do for any services? Uh, I saw people can book business consulting uh, sessions with you. Are you offering those right now? Um, uh, I, I would do technical consult. I'm, that's my background, but I'm trying to be less of it. So I'm trying to be expensive there. Um, I'm actually thinking about doing some readings just because I can, I want to practice. So I'm, you know, well, you would be great at it. I mean, just from talking to you, I know that, uh, you have all it, all it takes to really give people a lot. And, um, yeah, that's, yeah. I can definitely start, uh, throwing some folks your way. Um, so we'll talk about that. Awesome. So yeah, if anyone wants a reading from Sean, uh, what, what's your email? What's a good email to get a hold of you? Uh, Sean, S-E-A-N at rockstarantics.com or just go to brainlitter.com. That's my, it's a blog I started 18 years ago. It's basically a place I put before it falls out of my head. I, I have old blog posts in there where I've found my own technical things I've solved and didn't remember solving it. But like 16 years later, I'm like, oh, that's me. I love that. that's my sense of humor, yeah. right? So, so shit. I had that, that, that happened last, last week where I was trying to uh, figure out something. I, I do a lot of computer programming and I was, um, this one wasn't really programming. I was trying to figure out how to turn on, force turn on the OpenGL for a game on my Mac and this and that. And I, I found a thread where I had given the answer and I was like, yes, thank you, Jonah from six years ago. <laughs> Paying it forward to Jonah from now. Yep. So I can relate to that. Well, thank you so much, Sean. This has been an absolute delight and a joy. And uh, I hope to have you back soon. Okay. Thanks, man. That was fun. Thank you. See you, dude.